my name is Jason Grillo. I'm the event director for Air Miners. It's uh, once again a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, we've got a new topic today that we haven't really broached in our Air Miners conversation yet. Uh, it's a novel method of carbon removal that hasn't gotten quite as much attention that we're focusing on in terms of biomass harvesting and storage. Uh, to that end, we have a very esteemed panel of uh, thought leaders on this method of uh, breaking the carbon cycle so that we can ultimately uh, see a atmosphere that has much less carbon dioxide in it. Um, with So to give you a sense of how we're going to proceed, as usual, we're going to have our panel discussion. We'll start off with, a, with some remarks by Professor Zhao uh, and Dr. Amelsi uh, about the method of carbon removal. We'll get into a panel discussion after that with Q&A at the end. I'll come on near the top of the hour, give some final remarks, and then we'll have our networking uh, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific. At that point, you know, feel free to hang on. We'll do our networking event as we typically do in Zoom breakout rooms uh, to let you know, again, today's event is gonna be carbon negative on account of those who were very generous with donating to that, uh, that purpose. So with not any more ado, I want to pass the stage along to our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Amber Janda. Amber. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Amber Yanda from Exopus Carbon. I'm a co-founder and CTO. Um, my co-founder and president, John Lynn, will be co-moderating with me. Um, I'll be leading most of the discussion and he'll be analyzing the chat for um, the chat for the Q&A after the panel. Sorry about that. So um, I'd like to <laughs> introduce the panelists uh, first. We have um, Professor Ning Zheng. He is uh, from the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at the University of Maryland. And he conducts research in uh, technical solutions as well as uh, policy implications of climate change, uh, including renewable energy and uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, and then we also have Professor Jeffrey Amels. He spent 35 years at BP Amico Chemicals R&D and Currently, he is an invited associate professor in chemistry at the department, the chemistry department at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. Uh, he is the co-inventor of 17 issued or published patent applications. He's also a co-author of around 30 papers or conference presentations. And then um, on the startup side of things, we have Chris Canope. He is a CEO of Carbon Sequestration Inc. They are a Houston-based company focused on developing cost-effective biosequestration techniques using um, forestry waste. And the other startup we have is um, enhanced biomass sequestration. And the two panelists from that are uh, Dr. Howard Carr and Dr. Simon Avanel. They are based in Australia, so it's 3 a.m. their time. Uh, appreciate their flexibility. And they are trialing the repeated harvesting of coppicing, low rainfall, native Australian trees, and uh, storing those sub in a subterranean anoxic hypersaline uh, conditions. So um, with that, um, I, I just wanted to first provide a little bit of um, context on uh, the, the method that we're gonna talk about today from the scientific uh, peer reviewed publications that, because um, it's not a super well-known um, method and there hasn't been uh, a lot of scientific debate um, around it. So um, we'll start with the literature that I am aware of. Um, and uh, the scope of this review, this little brief review is going to be um, specifically the storage of terrestrial biomass with uh, minimal processing um, or treatment of that biomass. So very close to like raw biomass. Uh, and then storing that with the specific purpose of sequestering carbon. So that's the scope of this little uh, summary I'm about to give. So um, back in uh, 1999, the US Department of Energy re released a report called Carbon Sequestration R&D. Um, and uh, in that report, it was briefly mentioned that uh, slowing or preventing biomass from decomposing could be a way to sequester carbon. 
and uh, more specifically putting wood and paper products into landfills and then managing the landfills to minimize decomposition um, could be a way to sequester carbon with potentially greater capacity than natural uh, based nature based solutions. Uh, the next time I saw this uh, subject reappear was about August 2002. Um, David Keith from Harvard um, published a piece that uh, where he talked about burying or or burning or both um, the uh, biomass. Um, and he basically came to the conclusion that it, it depends on the economics, whether it makes sense to sequester or bury it um, or, or burn it or both. But at the time he was, he definitely was um, leaning towards burning it for energy and sequestering the CO2. And then the next thing I, that I noticed come up was uh, in January of 2008, Professor Zing, Professor Zeng, um, published a paper called Carbon Sequestration via Wood Burial, um, which you'll hear about uh, shortly in his introduction. Uh, and um, that is one of the, probably a very well-known paper in this field. Um, and then 10 years later in uh, 2018, uh, the National Academies of Sciences uh, released a report called Negative Emissions Technologies and Reli Reliable Sequestration. And um, there's discussion within the report about using landfills, again, uh, for storing um, carbon with the goal of managing the landfill to minimize rather than promote decomposition. Um, and so um, they actually didn't go into a lot of detail on uh, that method. And uh, when um, I followed up with them as to what happened to um, the debate regarding that or the, in, uh, the investigation, they, they basically said there were some resource constraints. And so uh, that's where things stand as far as the published scientific literature goes that I have, that I have found. So um, I will now pass it to um, our two professors, starting with Dr. Zing. Um, and they're gonna present for about five minutes to give a little bit more detail on the technical scientific um, background. Um, so with that, I will let uh, Professor Zing start with his uh, five minutes. All right, do you see my slides now? Yes, coming through loud and clear, thank you. Great. Um, first, let me say, um, I appreciate the opportunity um, to be able to present this idea here. Thank um, Ixa Quest Carbon and Air Miners for organizing this. So this idea of biomass burial, as Amber just introduced, has been around for a little while now, uh, but it's at a point that it's actually on the verge of what we know as the Valley of Death. So a lot of the characteristics are coming into light as people have looked at other carbon sequestration methods more closely. So I will argue that this is a method that is a combination of nature and engineering and technology. So we all know the two major categories of uh, negative emissions technologies, CCS, et cetera, engineering-based methods. Then on their side, you have the nature-based methods. Uh, for example, best known is planting trees. This is all great, but we know that the limitation of planting trees is fundamentally the land is limited. And there's potential risk of loss under disturbance as we see uh, these days, a lot of fire going on and so on. So from a carbon cycle perspective, um, biomass burial comes in like this. So you look at the total um, carbon sequestered each year by the terrestrial biosphere, that is 60 gigaton carbon. And the biosphere is more or less in equilibrium. That means pretty much all that goes back into the atmosphere via decomposition of dead organic matter. Now, the idea here is to say, how about we siphon off a fraction of this sequestered carbon, for example, three gigaton per year and put it into semi-permanent storage. Then the net result would be a reduction of three gigaton in decomposition as the forest is continually absorbing carbon. 
that will be equivalent to remove three gigaton per year of carbon from the atmosphere. And in the future, perhaps thousands of years later, if after we pass the climate crisis, this well-preserved storage could be a biomass, bioenergy, or carbon reserve. So the fundamental difference between biomass burial and the traditional nature-based methods such as planting trees is like you raise the chicken, not really for the chicken meat, but for the eggs. It is important to keep the chicken healthy, but the eggs will accumulate over time. That is the carbon uh, storage. So this idea, for example, has been put into comparison with other NETS methods in, for example, this 2011 earlier report, possibly the first um, full scale mention of the term negative emissions technology. And it's considered a low cost, 10 to $50 per ton CO2 with a potential of up to two to 10 gigaton CO2 per year. The recent National Academy report uh, comments on this method could be viable approaches to increasing carbon removal. To date, this proposed approach has not been tested, though the technology is simple and easily applied. Although I have to say, when you do it in practice, um, you see there are a lot of engineering obstacles and scientific questions need to be uh, resolved. So some of the main characteristics of the biomass burial method is this. You think of the idea itself, really trees are optimized by 3 billion years of evolution. So it's very good at carbon uptake, although not necessarily very good with energy uptake because the competition is to grow tall. And wood burial is the first step of fossilization process. That's the natural way to undo fossil fuel burning. So here are the two things I want to emphasize. One is the permanence, at least hundred of years we're talking about, so not decades. And it lends itself to monitoring and verification. And there are a number of things we can do, what we call low hanging fruits in the near term. For example, the fire in the America West, and how about we harvest that and thin the forest and bury the wood and also uh, forest residue, urban waste of wood. So this category of wood availability is right there and it's low cost. Here is a demo project that was conducted in 2013 near Montreal. Um, so finally, I want to show a couple of numbers. How much can we expect this method uh, to do in terms of sequestering carbon? To reach one megaton per year, one possibility to use unused urban wood residue on 25,000 kilometers square, the size of the state of Maryland. How to reach gigaton scale? For example, that is the amount of a quarter of the current world wood harvest rate. Alternative scenario is the 0.8 million kilometer square forest land in the Amazon that has been deforested since 1970. If we restore forest on that land and then manage it intensively, we could approach one gigaton scale. All right, so I'll leave that here and uh, looking forward to the following uh, presentation and the conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Professor Zing. Um, we'll uh, now move on to Professor um, Amels with uh, his point of view here. Professor Amels. Okay, uh, just sharing my screen. Okay, so um, my presentation is to try to make the case for biomass sequestration. So, uh, so Professor Zhang uh, showed why it's a good idea. Um, 
but um, I'm going to go back and, and make the case that it's needed because uh, some of the prior uh, technologies are not going to get us where we need to go. Uh, but I'm going to kind of go backwards. I'm going to put up our idea uh, for biomass sequestration, which is uh, which evolved a little differently from Professor Zhang's. And then I'll go back and uh, try to do the justification. The reason for that is we want to keep these presentations short to move on to discussion. So, um, so um, myself and my coworker, Dr. Paul Behrens, um, have written a preprint. Uh, remains unpublished at this point. It's called Sequestering Biomass for Natural, Efficient, and Low-Cost Direct Air Capture of Carbon Dioxide. So, um, so I think that title caught a lot of people's interest. Uh, the preprint's been downloaded uh, many times. It is a form of direct air capture, okay? Um, we're gonna grow biomass from CO2 in the air and the key is to remove it from the carbon cycle, as Professor Zhang said. Uh, so the, this um, uh, preprint is a fairly lengthy document, about 25 pages. Uh, first, I use it as a wake-up call that the numbers from prior technologies don't add up uh, to get us where we need to go to net zero. Um, and Again, our proposed uh, sources of biomass uh, differ slightly from Professor James. Uh, what we're proposing, what we originally proposed was using tree leaves. Um, on any given year, leaves represent a small fraction of the total above ground biomass of a tree. But if you integrate them over the total life of a tree, we show in the preprint that they can represent a substantial fraction of the total mass that is grown by a tree over its life could be uh, as much as 50 to 60%. Um, left undisturbed, um, leaves decompose and release their carbon back to the atmosphere as CO2 with a time constant of about a year. So, so the normal cycle of leaves is they fall off the tree and they decompose in about a year. If that didn't happen, uh, you would look at a forest and you would see the ground rising, okay? And clearly that doesn't happen. So, so walk into a forest this fall and take a look at the leaves that have fallen. Go back to that forest a year later and you'll see that a lot of that material has already disappeared. Um, so one advantage for using leaves is that it leaves uh, tree trunks and uh, the, the underlying forest undisturbed. Um, so the, the other source of biomass uh, that we would target would be biomass grown on purpose, such as high yield switchgrass. So switchgrass is similar to hay, which has well-known uh, cost structure to grow and to harvest, um, you know, which allows us to project a preliminary cost estimate for, for this technique. Um, our proposed method of storage, um, as Professor Zhang's is, uh, to bury it, um, to use landfills that have been modified to prevent aerobic and or anaerobic decomposition. Um, we believe this should be possible by understanding the chemistry of the landfill phases. And we go into more depth on this in, in the preprint, uh, where we show that even without intervention, in a normal landfill, only a fraction of biomass decomposes. Uh, that's why when you look at a landfill, you see a big mound, okay? Because landfills eventually go dormant and they stop decomposing. Um, another advantage for this is that it can be implemented in the time frame that's needed, 2030 to 2050. Okay, so now let me back up and uh, say why it's needed. Um, so currently about 35 gigatons a year of CO2 are being generated. Um, power was about 40% of the total US energy in 2016, represents a, a substantial fraction of the CO2 that's generated. So while growth in renewable energy is exploding, um, the current projections are that even by 2050, we're still gonna be using uh, 
um, natural gas to produce about 38%, uh, uh, 36%, I'm sorry, uh, from natural gas. Only 38% is gonna come from electricity, so. Uh, pr Professor Mills, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we are at about five minutes, so if you could just wrap up uh, in, in the next 30 seconds or so, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so again, uh, I go through uh, a couple of reasons why uh, uh, prior technologies are not going to get us where we go. Uh, you've seen recent reports that uh, the Democratic proposal um, may remove a billion tons of carbon dioxide. That's that's one gigaton, not ten or twenty. Um, clim as far as climate change goes, there are reports that not a single country in the G20 is going to meet their Paris climate agreements. Um, and um, there's been a lot of interest in hydrogen, uh, but uh, within the current plan out to 2030, uh, there's only about uh, 1.8 megatons of, of hydrogen that's, that's, that's currently in the plan. Uh, so again, that's not going to guess where we need to go. So, um, so, you know, there are technologies that work. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Melsi, I, I think, could we uh, possibly share some of the rest of this maybe during the discussion? Uh, we, we are at time now, so. Okay. Right. Um, Thank you very much. On. Okay, so at this point, um, we're going to move into the uh, panel discussion part of the event. Uh, thank you again, Professor Zhang and Professor Mills. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start with uh, asking um, some questions of the panelists and uh, I have some that are prepared, but we are also gonna kind of follow the dynamic of things. Um, so first uh, question uh, based on some of the interest from the audience uh, in their submissions um, is, uh, directed at the, at the founders of the, the startups, so EBS and, um, and CSI. Uh, the question is, how are you planning to turn uh, biomass storage into a business um, generally? And then in addition to that, what do you project your uh, dollar per ton CO2 removed um, cost to be? Um, so how about if we have um, Chris uh, Knope uh, address that first from CSI? Thank you, Amber. Thank you, professors. So about two and a half years ago, we started this company and immediately we were directed towards the low hanging fruit as both professors mentioned it, which is the timber residue. Um, <clears throat> my first step was to talk with some of the forest management groups in East Texas and Western Louisiana and we found that there was interest in getting rid of their wastes and burying those wastes. That's when the, the problem started to come along and we realized uh, a bunch of things. One, it was going to be harder to get the source material than we realized. Two, that the shipping, transportation, loading and unloading costs were going to be much higher than expected. Uh, three, that the the pit design was going to be larger and more complicated than we expected. But we've moved forward. Um, we've written out uh, RFPs for a couple of years now and uh, gotten our carbon accounting together. And we think that the number uh, total cost is going to be for right now around $37.50 per ton, which is substantially higher than the numbers that Professor Zhang quoted, but we think that there's more costs involved as well. There's so many uh, tiers of stakeholders, the landowners, the communities, uh, the, the owners of the vehicles, uh, uh, and you know, finally the, the registries and the governmental organizations which are going to review the, the MRV as I call it, methodology, monitoring, reporting, and independent verification. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Chris. Uh, let's give um, Dr. Avenel and uh, Dr. Carr um, some time to answer that as well, about two minutes. So let me tackle that, Amber. 
So our, our costs um, fit well within the envelope described by Professor Zhang. Um, and you know, we, we, our solution targets uh, low cost land uh, and very efficient materials handling. So transport costs are a killer here. And uh, we found a way to minimize those costs by uh, closely integrating biomass production and the sequestration sites. Okay, I think I think uh, an important uh, part of the audience is that, of course, the Australian ecology is quite different to uh, that of North America and Europe. And so, what we're using is uh, coppicing uh, native Australian plants. So we harvest them and they regrow. So we plant them once, and we get. Uh, in our financial model, 12 harvests from each planting. So that's a major contributor to reducing the cost is that for a one-off uh, cost of planting, you get many harvests. So that's one part, as Simon's mentioned, the low cost land, um, as, as a measure, our target, uh, our primary target area is around the 300 to 350 millimeter rainfall uh, zone where these uh, well-adapted plants uh, are endemic. And um, yeah, that land sells for sub 500 US dollars a hectare. So cheap land, high productivity, multiple harvests, and then all the other stuff is pretty much the same, dig a hole, fill it in. You know. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Drs. Abanel and uh, Carr. A um, couple of follow-up questions there. So. Um, Chris, you had mentioned that uh, your cost per ton um, right now, I think was what you said, was about uh, $37.50. Is that um, where you see it uh, remaining or do you see that uh, going down um, over time as certain factors uh, change? Um, could you uh, speak to that a little bit? Well, I think a good question and leads into another question that I've gotten from a lot of uh, interested participants, which is what is the scalability of this idea? And from my perspective, there's two types of, or two scales. One is the timber residues, the waste, which would include the deadwood debris on the forest floor in the Western states that could be causing uh, or helping forest fires. That's the low hanging fruit. We only get that one time. And in Southern Texas and Louisiana, we have approximately 2 million tons of waste. That would make for about 70 of the pits which we're designing, which uh, hold, uh, once they're complete, about 70,000 tons of CO2 each. These are very large pits. Each one is almost as big as digging out the Astrodome. Uh, foundation. So they hold about 3.8 uh, million uh, square feet, cubic feet, I'm sorry. And, and so the, the second area of scalability uh, is going to come in increasing uptakes uh, from carbon farms. We're going to have to have a whole class of carbon farmers to produce this material so that we can bury it. So I would say that the cost uh, from my perspective, won't go down from 3750. Uh, these uh, a ton of material uh, is a lot of material, and so it, it's usually not worth somebody's time to buy one or two tons. That's one of the problems. We lose a lot of material that way. The other thing is they're going to usually want more than 10 or 15 dollars per ton. That's half of our cost right there. Transportation is generally around two dollars per mile. And then we lose carbon emissions because 100 gallons of diesel fuel equal approximately a ton of CO2. So if we chip the material to improve compacting, we, we almost double our, uh, our project emissions. And then we have unloading into the pit and then the emissions from the pit itself, as well as the MRV, which generally is one of the most expensive parts of the project. Uh, of unknown cost because we don't have established MRV or a proven methodology for this yet. Very interesting. Thank you for your thoughts, Chris. Um, I think uh, your your 
comments on the MRV, which was to do with um, uh, monitoring and, and verification, uh, kind of leads into um, something else that we would like to discuss as well, which is um, the, the scientific research is sparse on uh, decomposition of biomass, uh, raw biomass preserved under the sorts of conditions that you and, and EBS are uh, proposing. So there are questions around uh, permanence of the storage um, as well as uh, the, the monitoring. So uh, the second thing that we'd like um, to know about is uh, the extent to which uh, the biomass is expected to resist decomposition under your conditions um, that you're proposing. Um, uh, we'd like EBS and uh, CI CSI to, to answer that first, and then um, I'll, we'd like to give the, uh, the two professors a chance um, to uh, react to that, share their thoughts as well. So um, let's start with uh, EBS. So, so let, me, let me start again. Um, the evidence from municipal landfill is pretty good at showing that the, the rates of uh, carbon retention are pretty good. Um, and that's with them out being, without them being specifically designed with carbon retention in mind. Um, but for, for me, the, this question is inherently empirical. Um, both the systems being discussed here uh, allow for direct measurement and quantification. So uh, we, we can learn by doing um, and over time, I think the, the retention rates can be extremely high. Howard? Okay, so again, I think, uh, you know, you just got to look at all the pathways for decomposition. And, and in fact, in this whole area, you got to focus on uh, everywhere where there's a potential for cost escalation or, or the converse cost reduction. So, so um, with respect to the biomass decomposition, I think it's important that you start with the right sort of biomass. So again, the native Australian biomass has uh, very high uh, crystalline cellulose content, very, uh, very well developed lignin protection, uh, low sugars, low carbohydrates. So this is the right sort of biomass that once you bury it, it's going to have uh, the chances of decomposition are, are reduced. Uh, Chris has already touched upon things like the, the cost of chipping. We 100% agree. We don't chip. We call what's chunking the biomass. So we chop it into pieces around 600 millimetres of length to allow for some materials handling, but we keep the pieces as big as possible. So I think it's about having the right, you know, tough sort of biomass to start with, keeping it as big as possible. The pits, uh, there's a whole bunch of parts around the pit, but obviously anoxic environments is, is very important. Um, and I guess finally from our, our side, you know, in our methodology that, that we've written uh, for the granting of our, of our credits, it's about uh, just, uh, you know, applying the science, sampling, uh, you know, statistical, statistically relevant sampling, uh, to show uh, where the carbon's going to. So we sample everything. So we sample the biomass, the gas, the water, just to, uh, to show uh, you know, the, where every molecule ends up. You know. Thank you, um, Howard. Uh, interesting thoughts um, there as far as uh, what you're gonna do with the, the biomass um, to keep it from decomposing. Um, Chris, did you have uh, comments to add on uh, how you are uh, what do you think about the extent of decomposition in, in your storage type? Well, we're trying to look at what the credit requirements are going to be. Right now, the American Carbon Registry is 100 years. And so our uh, objective is to get enough biomass so that at the end of 100 years, we know how much is there. Um, the IPCC has set a, a rate on how much uh, uh, biomass decays in landfill conditions. And I believe it's around, uh, I had a, in my notes, it's around 5%. So what we are proposing for our projects is a 15% carbon buffer, where we bury 15% additional carbon and then give ourselves for project emissions and for methane and CO2 escape that 15%. In terms of uh, of limiting and monitoring those amounts because 
honestly, no one knows. No one has done this yet. So our, our initial pilot projects, of which we have two, are going to focus on gathering as much information as we can from within the reservoir of the pit. The reservoir being the low porosity, low permeability region where the biomass is, and then covered by a high porosity, high permeability clay cap. And then in between that and interwoven in that is a gas collection system where we can monitor pressures at various depths and locations within the pit and then convert, if necessary, the CH4 or methane into CO2 and then let that escape as a project emission. So our gas collection system is going to be very important, not just for us, but for uh, getting this methodology approved and for determining exactly how uh, decomposition, both aerobic and anaerobic is occurring and, and then in what years. But we actually expect very little decomposition based on the science that I've seen uh, in the initial 10 years. Thank you uh, for those thoughts, Chris. Um, methane emissions is actually the, the topic that we would like to move into next, but um, uh, I'd like to, uh, to give uh, Professor Zeng and Amels a chance uh, to uh, share their, their thoughts on, uh, on decomposition as well. And if they had would, would like to build on anything that uh, you and uh, Howard and uh, Simon had said. Well, um, yeah, go ahead, Professor. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll go first. So, um, so again, I think if you understand the chemistry, landfills go through several chemistry phases. Um, and if you understand that chemistry, I think there's opportunities to intercept the decomposition at each one. Now we go into that in the preprint a little bit. So, um, and again, we've shown that uh, the normal landfill will eventually go dormant. Uh, it'll stop producing gas after a period of time. And in a normal landfill, without any intervention taking, taking place, um, maybe only 40, 30, 40% 30, decomposes. So we'd like to get that down, you know, by understanding the chemistry and, and, and intervening. And, you know, we have some ideas on how to do that. But as uh, Chris said, um, all of this is fairly new and needs to be demonstrated. Thank you, uh, Professor Amels. Uh, Professor Zhang, did, did you have um, additions to that or comments? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, the landfill emissions may be misused by some. I can understand the concern. Landfill has a lot of decomposition, both anaerobic and aerobic going on mostly because of the supply of food, easily decomposable, nutritious uh, material. Here, we're talking about something that is really very different. And in fact, we are calling this wood fail. Um, it's a clean vegetation uh, burial, and uh, it should be buried the right way. So if it's done not right, of course, it can still decompose. And main thing is this, lignin, um, bacteria, mm -hmm. anaerobic bacteria don't really like, they can't digest lignin. So wood is a result of three billions of evolution. Plants produce that so that they can stand up for 100 years without dying, without decaying. So it's very resistant. In anaerobic condition, you only have a very, very few organisms can actually tackle them. So there are plenty of evidence. For example, the New Zealand kauri tree buried pretty superficially, not even that deep. It's totally fresh and we dig it out and they are beyond carbon dating age. So we're looking at a very, very different environment. And I'll be happy to talk more specific technical details afterwards. But the main thing is really this kind of burial, if it's done right, is ex expected to become geological, sedimentary, not like usual landfill. 
If I could just make a, a quick follow-up comment to what Professor Zhang said. So, so yes, bearing um, cellulose, bearing leaf or log material. Um, again, if you understand the chemistry, so so cellulose is not like starch or or food waste. Cellulose is very compact, and the chemical bonds are are cross-linked. That makes the primary step that is needed for decomposition very difficult. Okay, um, so so cellulose is a polymer of sugars. You need to attack those and depolymerize them by hydrolysis. And the fact that the lignocellulose structure is cross-linked make that attack by water very, very difficult. So, so again, if you understand all the chemistry, I think we can intercept it. The key is gonna to be to keep oxygen out, to keep water out, to keep the primary attack out, um, and uh, some other uh, points you know, that, that we mentioned in the preprint. Thank you, Professor Mills. Um, so given all that we've um, discussed right now about um, emissions and decomposition, um, how, roughly how long um, uh, Chris and uh, Dr. Avenel and Dr. Carr, uh, roughly how long would you expect uh, the biomass in your storage to uh, persist uh, relative to if it had been allowed to just sit out and, and decompose? Um, I'll let uh, EBS start with that. You wanna go, so? Okay. This one's um, you had. Well, you know, if, if you listen to what uh, the professor and Dr. Uh, Amelisa just said, then it's all about getting the conditions right. So if you get the conditions right, we think that uh, with the, again, with the right biomass, high cellulose, high lignin content, et cetera, uh, we think it's, it's, uh, it's going on ad infinitum. We think that it's going to turn into coal. We think it's there for several million years. So, um, uh, we don't have any problems about uh, the longevity for the pur purpose of uh, writing business plans, etc. We sort of, you know, pluck figures out of the air of you know, 100 years or 1000 years. But the reality is we, you know, in our hearts are thinking millions. Okay, um, Chris, your thoughts? Well, we'll never know unless we get started. So I, I agree that right we have answer. to start. <laughs> we, we have to start getting the information now. I think if we reproduce a, uh, a natural oil and gas formation close to the ground level where we have low pressure reservoir that we can control and a low permeability cap that we keep the low pressure reservoir and we can take gas out of there when we need to or even add gas in some cases, um, that, that we can control those conditions and we can find out instead of me speculating. But another uh, issue that doesn't, hasn't been talked about yet is the compaction of the biomass. And I think that's going to play a major role into how much water is allowed into the reservoir or into the biomass and how well the lignin can keep its structure. Uh, 500 years would be would be my my goal on this. Although uh, I agree with Howard that we're probably looking at long term sequestration. Thanks, Chris. Um, we we only have actually just a, a few minutes until uh, the Q and A starts. So um, I will cover just a, a couple more questions um, briefly. Um, we did we discussed monitoring and verification, which there was a lot of interest in that topic from from registrants, so thank you for that. Um, could you comment on uh, what the life cycle CO2 emissions um, from your storage would be? In other words, uh, how much net uh, carbon carbon dioxide removal would you expect per ton? So um, I'll I, let, you can start, Simon. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. So our life cycle analysis allowing for, uh, you know, the diesel to transport diesel on all, all, all such inputs is about 15 kilograms of CO2 emissions per, per tonne, per thousand kilograms of um, CO2 removed from the atmosphere. 
So 1.5%, roughly. A bit less, okay. but... Great. And Chris, uh, what, what number? Uh, in, in terms of uh, what 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 ratio are you looking for? Like our, so if we're burying seventy thousand tons of CE of uh, CO two, our project emissions on that are going to be around four thousand tons of CO two. Uh, now the escape emissions, which is our carbon buffer, that makes up the the you know, around the 15% number. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so we are out of time just about. So in about uh, 30 seconds to a minute, um, we obviously haven't covered uh, every single issue relating to biomass uh, burial here, but um, for, for the panelists, uh, what one final point would you make in about 30 seconds uh, before we open up the Q&A? Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Zeng. Um, I can follow up what we just said earlier about the landfill analogy, the concern. It's very legitimate. And uh, any method, especially I've seen biological method, can easily be abused. So it's actually very important for government and uh, private sectors to put in the effort to do research and make sure the method is applied correctly, do the right thing. Um, any uh, concluding remarks from Professor Anels or our two uh, startup teams? Yeah, um, so the comments that I would make are, um, I've seen some questions coming in about uh, um, alternate methods like biochar. So, so the one advantage that this has is that potentially we can sequester 100% of the carbon if we can get the decomposition down to zero. That's one point. Two, other methods will be high capital, high energy. Um, so here, we're growing the biomass for free. Uh, there is cost with uh, gathering it up, okay? But this is, this is, you know, high level, it's gotta be a low cost uh, method compared to some of the other um, methods that are being talked about. Thank you, uh, Professor Mills. Uh, Chris, any final thoughts? Well, I'd like to highlight, this might sound like it's coming out of the blue, but the, uh, the C4 fixation. Some plants use a different type of uh, photosynthesis that generates more carbon. There was an article in Bloomberg about this in 2019 about the Polonial, uh, excuse me, the royal empress tree, sometimes called the Polonia tree, that can sequester, according to World Tree, up to 100 tons of CO2 per acre per year. If we could reach anything close to that, we have over 700 million acres of forests, around the same amount of farmland, uh, we could easily become carbon negative with these large polonial uh, plantations. But even if our uptake rates are even 10, 20 uh, uh, tons of CO2 per acre per year, we could have a huge uh, uh, source material for wood harvest and storage that goes far beyond the wood residues and waste that we have available. Okay, great, thanks. So um, in our last uh, 10 minutes of uh, the one hour window, um, we're gonna open up the, uh, the questions to um, the audience and uh, John is going to be helping me do that. He has been monitoring the chat um, as I've been moderating, moderating the panel. So um, John, uh, what is uh, the first question you have ready and who would you like to start answering that? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to say you know, thank you for all the questions and comments in the chat. Um, it won't be possible to answer all of them. So I'm, I'm just trying to see which themes came up most frequently. I do wanna go back to something that Professor Amelsi mentioned towards the end there uh, about biochar. There are several people have asked about biochar and pyrolysis and, and why uh, our panelists think that biomass storage in the ways that they're suggesting are better than, than uh, a paralysis approach. So perhaps uh, let's have one of the startups comment on that, maybe um, EBS, please. Um, let me have a crack at that. Um, so, so 
The conversion to biochar, you, you lose north of 50% of the stored carbon for, for a start. And then you've got the distribution costs of moving, moving the um, biochar around to you know, put it to some useful purpose on farmland. Uh, all adds costs. And from our point of view, meaningful action on climate change needs, needs affordable solutions. And biomass sequestration provides a affordable, scalable solution. And um, let's focus on the CO2 for the moment. Uh, that's the crisis. I think in a yes. nutshell, it's just, uh, you know, keep it simple. You know, uh, if you get the conditions right, the biomass right, then uh, the simplest way is just to put the raw biomass into the pit, stop its decomposition. The more complexity, the more chance of leakage, the more chance for cost es escalation. Thank you, uh, Simon and Howard for that start. Um, Simon, you were uh, talking a lot about um, costs. I know that uh, Professor Amils has uh, quite a background in um, the costs, uh, uh, capital costs and things like that uh, from being at BP. Um, would you have any thoughts in that context as well, Dr. Amils? Um, so again, you know, uh, some of their other technologies going back to biochar, so how do you make biochar? You've got to heat it up. You need a furnace. Um, you know, the various techniques have holding times. You need holding vessels. Going to be high capital. Um, we could be talking hundreds of millions of dollars for a large process. So, and, uh, you know, again, the other thing about the biochar, as I said, uh, another issue is yield, you know, um, because uh, these processes don't per, uh, produce 100% biochar. I've seen yields as low as 20 to 46%. So you're also producing gas, you're producing liquid. You have to have outlets for those. You can't afford to throw it away and have an economic process. You're putting energy into the process. Energy is really, again, a loss of carbon. So, so you, could, you could make that energy renewable by using biomass to, to fire your furnaces, I suppose. Okay, but then that means a loss of biomass. Um, if that energy is coming from natural gas, then you're putting uh, fossil fuel CO2 back into the atmosphere. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mills. Um, did uh, we have any comments from Chris or Professor Zeng before um, John uh, moves on to the next question? Well, I'd just like to say, if, if we can get a good price on the biochar, we're open to it. And we have uh, some researchers that are looking at, you know, you know, how to, you know, because we have the source material. We have the, the biomass to create the biochar. So if we can get that biochar to the market and get more per ton uh, than our carbon credits, I have no problem with that at all. But the yield problem is, is as highlighted by everyone. I've seen much lower than that, the 10 to 15% yield. So in other words, you have 50% uh, carbon in your wood and then at the end of the day, you might have uh, a small little chunk of, uh, of biochar that represents a, a fraction of what you started with. You lose that to volatile organic compounds, as Professor MLC said, and it's very hard without a large operation to capture those volatile organic uh, compounds and then transport them to the correct market for them. Hey, thank you, Chris. I, um, unless you had something uh, to add, uh, Professor Zhang, I think we should move on to uh, another question in our last five minutes of the, the hour. Yeah, um, if possible, I would like to be able to get uh, two questions asked and responses to go around. So this, this first one here is something I hope you guys can comment on fairly quickly. But somebody asked, you know, you're talking about the costs involved in biomass harvesting and processing. Would you reduce those costs by moving to developing countries where land and labor are potentially much cheaper than in Australia and the United States? I'll put that to the, the startups first. Okay, so absolutely our, our model, our solution works in much of the developing world. Uh, so basically anywhere where you've got a dry desert meaning farmland, 
is the kind of land we're targeting. There's lots of that kind of country around the world. Sovereign risk, is, sovereign risk issues are the big one here. You know, we, we've got a lot of experience in this part of the world in operating uh, mining projects and so forth in places like Africa. And it's extremely difficult to get the certainty of land tenure that you need for long-term operations. I think uh, <clears throat> from our perspective, it's about uh, you know, the right sort of land. So the land that we're using is, uh, is flat open plains. It's not traditional forestry land in, in mountains with uh, you know, streams and glaciers, et cetera. So this is big open, open prairie type farmland, which is amenable to mechanization. So uh, uh, we're just going down that path of uh, low labor inputs with uh, mechanization uh, to reduce our costs. Uh, obviously, we touched upon the cheap land, the high biomass productivity, um, and you know, large earth moving equipment, large uh, mechanized planters, harvesters, transportation systems, etc. So we, um, we, we, we think that uh, mechanization uh, with that rule of law and sovereign risk issues addressed um, is, uh, is, is our advantage here. Any, any quick thought from Chris before John uh, gives his uh, last question? So I, I think the international problem for me is the MRV. You know, we want to have good title to the land. We know that we can have that in the US. Um, we have better relationships, hopefully, with the regulatory authorities. Any groundwater issues or long-term storage issues, we'll be able to communicate more effectively. And then on the measurement and monitoring, we want some place that's close because at least during the initial phases, we want access to the site so that we can monitor it on a monthly basis. And uh, Let me let's add to that, John, sorry, quickly. I, I actually think there is a great opportunity in developing countries, for example, Amazon, Southeast Asia, Africa, the deforest regions. So much money and the international attention has been paid to this problem. And uh, this method could come in if it's done right. Um, to be a good complementary thing we can do uh, related to Red Plus and other efforts. Okay, uh, so for last uh, question um, from John, uh, we're gonna need uh, one sentence answer. So uh, go ahead, okay. John. Well, well what, what's, uh, this is all we'll have time for. So what's your last uh, sentence to the audience? What do you want them to take away from this? Well, everybody will get a chance. Okay, how about if we start with um, uh, uh, Chris on that? I, I think we have to get started. I only had one sentence, right? That's right, <laughs> that's right. How, how about uh, Simon and Howard? Yes, let's get started. Yeah, low cost. Just look at all, all your costs and your leakage. Just eliminate, eliminate leakage, reduce costs. Professor Amelsi? Yeah, exactly. Low cost and, and high yield of carbon in the biomass going towards carbon removal from the air. So no expensive equipment. Uh, let nature grow the stuff. All I got to do is harvest it and get it in the ground. Simple is good. All right. Pro Professor yeah, Zhang, you get the last word. We need everybody, way more people to support this idea to get it started. Thank you so much, everyone. I think Jason's gonna jump in now. Sure, sure. Thank you, Amber and John, and thank you to our panelists for a, for a lovely discussion. So uh, to that end, you know, we are, uh, you know, bio, the um, practice of biomass removal and uh, bio, biomass harvesting and storage is gonna need more people, just like most of our other methodologies in carbon removal uh, are looking for people to push the envelope of what's possible and to achieve what we want in removing carbon from the atmosphere. So thank you to our audience for coming today. Uh, our next event in two weeks is gonna focus uh, from an investor's perspective. You know, what is going to unlock potential for carbon removal to achieve uh, rapid growth in the future. So this event is going to be recorded. It's going to be put up on our YouTube channel, and we'll also uh, circulate that recording to you in the uh, 
it afterwards. I'm going to add the uh, right now. I'm going to add the Google form for you to provide your feedback. We're going to send a feedback survey email to everybody who registered for today. So thank you so much. Feel free to hang on for networking afterwards. And uh, if not, we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone.